This century has seen a dramatic collapse in religion, including in Catholicism here in America. What is causing so many people to lose their faith? We're going to talk to an expert in the field about this on today's podcast. Hello, I'm Eric Sammons, your host and editor-in-chief of Crisis Magazine. Before we get started, I just want to encourage people to uh, smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. Also, you can follow us on social media at Crisis Mag. And actually, before I go too much further, uh, this month we're doing our twice a year uh, fundraising. So go to crisismagazine.com slash donate. I had forgotten I was going to say that. That's why I wasn't prepared for it. So anyway, our guest today is, is Stephen Bullivant. He holds professoral positions at St. Mary's University, London, and the University of Notre Dame, Sydney. He has doctorates in theology and sociology. His studies of contemporary non-religiosity have received wide international coverage, including from the BBC, the New York Times, The Economist, Financial Times, and Der Spiegel. He's the author of Mass Exodus, Catholic Disaffiliation in Britain and America since Vatican II, a very excellent book. And also, most recently, I have it right here, Nonverts, The Making of Ex-Christian America. Welcome to the program, Stephen. Well, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be on. Yeah, this is an, a, a topic that I have been very interested in and follow for a very long time, and I find your work to be excellent. Uh, I was director of evangelization for five years for a diocese. I worked. Uh, I was head of evangelization for a parish for a number of years before that, and so I've always been interested in like, okay, why are people leaving? How can we get them to come back? And I feel like your work is is really helping us to establish a lot of the reasons why people are leaving. Hopefully. So they will uh, come back. Um, but I want what I want to start with is I'm just going to show some charts. And for those who are listening, I will describe them because I think I want to set the table here uh, for what we're talking about. OK, so the first chart, let me pull up here, is from your book. And it's the proportions of all U.S. adults and U.S. adults under 30 with no religious affiliation over time. And for those who can't see this, basically what happens is you see from 1972 to about 1992, it's pretty steady. You're in for uh, all adults. It's, it's around the five to eight percent range for younger uh, under 30 adults. It's maybe 10 to 15 percent range. And that's pretty steady between 72 to 92. But then you start to see an increase. And again, this is um, religious. No people with no religious affiliation. So from our perspective, this is a bad thing for this to go up. And it goes up until it's at 23 percent in 2018 for all adults and 34 percent for uh, adults under 30 in 2018. So we see this increase in no religious affiliation. Uh, and I want to show you the next chart is going to be just church membership. This is from Gallup. And it's similar numbers. It goes back a little bit deeper. Um, it goes back to 19, early 1930s. And the question is simply, do you happen to be a member of a church, synagogue, or mosque? So again, this, they call it church membership, obviously, synagogue or mosque, so religious membership. And what we see is from late 1930s to about the mid-late 1990s, we again see a, a relatively steady number. It's 73% in the early 19, late 1930s, it's 70% in the late, mid and late 1990s. So again, say, but then from around 2000 until today, it, it just collapses. All of a sudden you go from 70% right before 2000 and 2020, I think it was actually 2019. I can't remember now. It's 47%. It's under 50% for the first time in U S history of people who, who say I am a member of a church synagogue or mosque, which is a little bit different uh, than the religious affiliation question, but very similar. Um, it's kind of a harder measure as well. I mean, this is an actual member of, you have a proper community rather than you just kind of tick a box, right? So this is an even more striking. Yes, absolutely. Good point. Yeah, this is somebody who says, yeah, I'm actually a member. I, I'm in their roles and I'm willing to admit it publicly. <laughs> um, and so it's it's a huge collapse though from around 2000 to uh, today. And then on the, because most of our audience is Catholic, let me look at show a few Catholic numbers. I believe this is from CARA. Yeah, this is from CARA, the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate from Georgetown University. And this is weekly mass attending U.S. Catholics from 1970 to today. And again, we see it's a drop definitely from 1970 to around 2000. There's a little bit of a tick of an increase between 1995 and 2000. 
But again, from 2000 until today, we see a huge drop in people who say they attend mass weekly. I think this is this the way they word this. They just simply say, how often do you attend mass? And one of the options is simply weekly. Um, and again, this is I believe this is I should have had this on the chart. But I think this is from Kara. And then the final chart is one of my favorites. And I mean that in a very uh, disturbing sense, uh, because I think it shows something very dramatic. And this is infant. This is again from Kara. This is infant baptisms in the United States, uh, Catholic uh, infant baptisms. I always feel like this is one of the most important numbers because I feel like infant baptism represents uh, kind of like, do you really believe in what this church is saying? Because first of all, you're having kids and you're baptizing them. And if, because if you don't baptize them, your kids, you're not even doing kind of the minimal that we would say means like, okay, I take my faith at least minimally serious. Because even people who don't attend mass twice a year often baptize their, their kids. And so what we see is there's a drop, pretty significant drop from 1970 to 1975. And then it, a general kind of steady increase. But of course, remember, this is total number, which means immigration, people coming in, things like that affects it. And so really the fact that it increases a little bit from 1975 to 2000 isn't that great of a sign, but it stays relatively steady. And then from 2000 until 2019, a collapse, a 41.5% decrease in the number of infant baptisms that have occurred uh, in, in America since the year 2000. So I am setting up a very depressing scene. <laughs> and to be honest, in reading your book, Nonverts, I found it, I found it excellent, but I also found it uh, very discouraging and, and somewhat depressing even. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I guess my, I guess I just have to ask in 30 seconds or left, less, what happened? No, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> um, but seriously, what would you say just on a very high level has occurred? And I specifically want to focus in the decrease since this century, since late 90s, yeah, yeah. 2000, what would you say are kind of the major factors that have caused this collapse of religion, including Catholicism in America? Yeah, well, I think there's, there's kind of a, there's two, there's a long story and a short story, right? And in a sense, I think what we're seeing, you know, in those, and that, I mean, the baptism chart is, is maybe the starkest there, because you're right that, you know, there's a lot of people who, you know, have never practiced since their own baptism, uh, who still get their kids baptized for family, ethnic, cultural, you know, all sorts of rite of passage reasons. Um, and when that's gone, I mean, that's really shows in the same way that the ticking the box does, you know, there's a sense in which these are the, the last things to go. Um, you know, so in, in a sense, those things only go at the tail end of, a couple of generations of decline, you know, and we had this kind of, there was this period in kind of the eighties, nineties, I think when um, church leaders and, and we could kind of comfort each other by saying, you know, um, yeah, people don't go to mass like they used to, but you know, once a Catholic, always a Catholic and, you know, you scratch the surface and these people are, are really Catholic and, and it, you often heard it said, uh, at least from bishops, you know, that, being, being a devout Catholic doesn't mean something different now. So like you don't have to be there every week to still be a kind of a good Catholic. You kind of get this kind of changing of the benchmark. Right. And actually now we're beginning to see that that's a transitional phase of, of a waning generation. Okay. That just, that doesn't keep going forever because how, how can it, you know, it doesn't mean anything for the third, fourth generation. So there's this kind of long story that you can either state after the second world war, which in, in, in mass exodus, so I kind of do that. Um, then things come to a head in the 60s, partly because the, you know, the baby boomers are coming of age um, at a time when everything's changing, including in the church. Um, and, and it's from the 1960s when we start seeing uh, church going falling. So people are still identifying, people are still um, often being church members, but they're going less and less often. OK, so if you look at, again, as you as you rightly point out, immigration plays in, in you know, is a counter effect. There's all sorts of stuff going on in any one place, but certainly a good portion of Catholicism and also the mainline churches, you know, from the 70s, 80s, you know, weekly church attendance is going down and down and down. And then 
by the time you get to the late 90s, and then this is the sort of the the short story, is you've got this generation, the millennials, who have been raised in a much less religious world to their parents and grandparents, are much less likely to have been raised in any kind of seriously religious way. Obviously, that's going to look very different depending on your family, where you are, all kinds of factors. You know, if you're even evangelical or if you're Mormon or if you're Catholic, if you're mainline, okay. But nevertheless, there's a, there's a much bigger pool of people who have had a pretty weak religious upbringing and they're coming of age at a time. The Internet's changing things, less so for Catholics, I think, but also for evangelicals, Mormons, that's a much bigger thing. Um, and it's a time when after the Berlin Wall comes down, after the end of communism, you've, you've had this kind of generation of people who are no longer raised with this Christian America versus Godless communism mood music. Um, and it's a time when, you know, the big existential threat to the country isn't people with no religion. It's people with too much religion. OK, you've got the rise of Islam is terrorism. Obviously, 9-11 is, is the, the most obvious landmark in that. But that's that doesn't just begin in 2001. Um, so it's a lot of things all coming together at once on, on particularly the millennial generation. And it's striking that first chart you showed that it's the under 35s are kind of always the vanguard. Um, and it's precisely that, um, you know, you've got this kind of waned uh, religiosity, uh, you know, of, of, of a whole generation and then various things kind of playing into that. And then suddenly you start getting headlines that say nuns on the rise. And then people start thinking, oh, I guess I'm one of those. So the next time it's a survey, more people tick the box. And then it kind of becomes this kind of um, this snowballing effect. Yeah. I, would it be fair to categorize it like this from the mid 1960s or so, maybe even a little bit earlier until the mid 1990s, late 1990s? What we see is a weakening yeah. where people are still identifying as I am Catholic, I am a pro, uh, Methodist or whatever the case may be. But there's a weakening in actual practice and maybe even belief. Yeah, absolutely. And then from the mid nine, late 90s till today, both them and their kids are starting to say, you know, I don't really even need to say I'm part of this religion anymore because I really don't believe it. Is that kind of a fair, very general, very broad way to describe it? I think that's basically it. And also, you know, you've got this generational thing. So for those people, you know, and those people are the ones who aren't getting their kids baptized after 2000. Now, you probably, what they don't have, but their parents had, was religiously practicing parents kind of breathing down their neck, right? Right. You see, of, of course you're getting them baptized. We got, you know, that's now what two generations, if not three generations back. So they might have been baptized because of like, you know, the grandma would have, mm -hmm. would have, you know, it would have been a thing. But for their parents, it who cares? I mean, you do you kind of thing. So absolutely, it's that kind of, um, as I say, it's it, it's it's the the fruits of you know two three generations of of this kind of hollowing out, if you like, of uh, American Christianity. Yeah, I feel like that's been my experience, just anecdotally. In that, okay, I'm in my fifties, and what I've noticed is like my parents' generation, they were practicing. They were, I mean, I grew up Methodist, but I'm talking about both my parents, like my wife's parents, you know, Catholic, Protestant, whatever. They, they identified as their religion. And then my generation, much less so, they identified as it, but they didn't practice, I guess the best way to put it. Yeah. And then my kids' generation, they're just, unfortunately, not my kids right yet, or hopefully never. Um, but they just simply are like, it's not worth the point. Now, I know like for, from a Catholic perspective, when I was first looking at this, this information myself, looking at these numbers, I at first only saw the Catholic numbers. And so I was like, it's a Catholic thing, especially at infant baptism. When I saw those numbers, I, my first in instinct was, well, Vatican II, all the changes, all that. But then when I looked more into it, I was like, oh, wait a second. Every religion in America is dropping at very similar rates, very similar time frames, And so we can't really I, I do want to talk about Vatican II in a little bit because your book Mass Exodus talks about it. But but what we then say were those factors that caused 
basically Americans to, to, to lose their religion. I mean, you, you mentioned World War II after that and things like, but what were the actual things? Was it the sexual revol revolution, move to the suburbs? I mean, what was it that, what were the main factors that caused this? Yeah, I think certainly the, it's that, that, that post, I mean, I, I talk in mass exodus about, you know, the baby boomers are kind of more sinned against than sinning in this because they're the generation that are brought up very differently to how their parents were. Um, and I mean, the Catholics are quite a good case of this, but it, it, it's it's true of others. You know, if, if you were raised before the war, you were raised often in kind of like a, you know, a neighborhood where everyone you lived with was some other kind of not just Catholic, but like Irish Catholic or Polish Catholic or, or, or Jewish or, you know, like and, and you you have these kind of like, you know, the kind of classic inner city kind of ghettos in inverted commas. Um, and then after the war, A, there's quite a lot of uh, mixing that happens with the war. Um, you know, just people, people, you know, if you're raised in small town Kansas, and you only know people in small town Kansas, and then you go off to fight or you go off to whatever, and then you get the GI Bill means that you then, you know, go off to college and then move out of state. And there's all sorts of things going down that kind of break down these kind of communities. And your kids are far more likely to be raised in the suburbs, far less likely to be raised in these kind of very close kind of enclaves. And because there's so many of them, you know, they're called the baby boomers because there was a very low uh, fertility rate because of the depression and then the Second World War for a long period. So there weren't many ki older kids. And then suddenly there's loads of kids. And they're just, they're always going to come of age in a an interesting way, right? And, and you can see this in by the 50s, there's all this kind of uh, um, concerned, uh, mystified commentary, you know, from, you know, their parents' generation, trying to understand these teen ages. Um, and, and also you're beginning to see concerns expressed by churches that we're kind of losing the youth. And then the 1960s just happen, you know, there's a big kind of, anti-authoritarian thing that happened in the 60s i mean especially around vietnam and um, there's a sexual revolution which in all sorts of ways um impacts upon the churches partly because the i mean the the arguments over contraception had happened in the 30s so you know and, and the, in, in a sense the catholic church becomes controversial for being the only one left standing almost right. in american catholicism right and, you know, and, and and there's a whole story to talk about why you know every other denomination changed its teaching in the 30s and 40s, and it's it's mainly about eugenics actually, um, but that's a whole other story to talk about. But 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 then everything else kind of comes along, and what we see after that in in the churches is that either people think well, you know, the churches are at odds whether this is gender roles, whether this is divorce, whether this is abortion, whether it's contraception, that the, you know, the churches are kind of increasingly either at odds with what are thought to be mainstream normal values, okay, the kind of the mainstream American cultural values and norms. Or you get this kind of argument within the churches, and you see this particularly in the mainline churches, which then kind of rip themselves apart, either trying to accommodate the new views or trying to, you know, stand up for the old ways. And, and there's no easy way to do this. So there's this kind of fracturing of of the churches into the 70s, 80s. Um, there's all sorts, I mean, it's not just a Catholic thing, but there's all sorts of like weird liturgical experimentation that goes on. And we know the Catholic story here, yeah. but you get the very similar sorts of, you know, if you read like, what reform and liberal Jewish synagogues were doing to try and keep the youth. Um, and it was kind of, it was Peter, Paul and Mary songs at, you know, at, at synagogue on Shabbat and things like that. Right. Um, Man, they had to go through that too. Oh, God yeah. bless them. <laughs> or, you know, exactly the same things are happening in the, you know, the Episcopalian churches and the Methodist churches and that kind of stuff. Oh, so you get this whole, and none of it works. Right. Right. Um, so this, this whole kind of like, desperate attempt to kind of keep the youth meanwhile you've got these you know young people again this is a generation far less likely to like live near the extended family than their certainly than their parents and even more so their grandparents far more likely to have mixed marriages um 
and and you know going to be that much you know removed once again from these kind of you know small either either small town or small inner city enclaves um you know where one social life was was basically your your church you know it was built around the church um now the mega churches come into that void and specifically aim themselves at people living in the your families in the suburbs who don't go to church anymore but kind of have a guilty conscience about it don't really like churchy things but feel like it's a good thing to do so you kind of create a church that doesn't look like a church that has excellent parking and you know and, but but then kind of builds the social life around the church in the way that the old in the city churches kind of did naturally the mega churches kind of construct it artificially and and there's a market for that and that's where you see so that kind of works but it's it's working in this kind of change situation so there's a lot of stuff going on right um and and there's this con you know any one year doesn't look like a crisis and i think this is the critical thing is that any one year you know some people have come some people have gone we look about maybe we're down a few but you know that could be you know that that just that's just ordinary fluctuation but it's that kind of you know losing one percent every year for 40 years right yeah you know and it, it's it's that kind of thing you know there was never any one year when it collapsed so it all you could always just about kind of feel that you know business as usual you know i'm sure once we once we um instigate this new scheme or we you know we we try the vigil mass or we get the new youth minister or we do something then we'll be back on the back on the steady or the the up curve again and it just never nothing worked yeah I, and nothing did work <laughs> and I, so I remember when i became catholic in the early 1990s there was a turn here in america of of among catholics like okay we're moving away from the silly 70s and the 80s where we did all this weird stuff and, you know, the weird liturgies, the weird catechism and all that stuff. And now we're going to be more uh, orthodox, more JP2. And sure enough, you saw where the number of converts each year was like 150,000. I mean, a very impressive number each year. Now, yeah, of course, yeah. we didn't talk about the fact that there was also a bunch of people leaving out the door. But the fact is there were a lot of people coming in. And we, I know a lot of us, I know I felt like this and a lot of us thought, okay, we've turned the corner and now the 21st century, we're going to see things turn around because we're embracing kind of a JP2 orthodoxy. We're embracing, you know, we're, we're done with the, the experimentation. Um, but of course, that's not at all what happened. You can't say, and for those who might jump and say, well, how about Pope Francis? Well, from the 1990s to Pope Francis is still about 20 years and it just didn't happen. We saw the, the decrease happen. The collapse starts 13, 15 years before Pope Francis becomes Pope. So you can't, you know, I'm not defending him, but at the same time, you can't point it at him. He's a bishop in Argentina at this point. Um, so my question is, what happened in the 90s that really led to where this weakening turned into a complete collapse, even among, because I remember there's books written about, oh, what we need to do is just as long as we embrace orthodoxy, and I mean that in the small o, Catholics saying that, pro evangelical saying yeah, yeah. that, yeah. embrace this, then things will turn around because by embracing the, the the world for the past 30 years, everybody left. Now if we embrace it, and there were certain signs that this was true, but yet that's not at all what happened. Is it because we didn't embrace orthodoxy in us, or was there just so many factors that it was just like trying to put your finger on, you know, in the in the crack in the dam? Yeah, I think I think basically there's there's all in any one moment in any one community in any one parish, but obviously you can extend that over a whole country, right? There's there's all sorts of different factors coming into play, and immigrations or you know the the inflows or outflows according to like you know where the jobs are is always a big thing. Um, you know the the birth rate is a big you know Catholic birth rate you know the the national birth rate as a whole kind of goes down, which is a big factor, a huge factor. You know, if you've got kind of, you know, older people dying off and you're given that there was a massive birth rate with the 60s and, you know, well, the, the boomers, 
Um, and then, you know, birth rates really plummeted. Um, that's going to have an effect. You know, obviously it is. Um, and, and it's going to have an effect for the, you know, the next kind of 60, 70, 80 years. <laughs> like, right. um, so, so you know, you, you're playing with these kind of facts. You're playing with this kind of transmission fact in that it becomes more and more an uphill struggle for, you know, kids raised as an ex to remain as an ex into adulthood to then be a practicing ex for their kids to then, you know, be raised as an ex to, to continue the process, right? Um, and, and actually, I think that the, the, you know, that kind of JP2 generation and then, you know, the Benedict thing um, was exactly the right sort of thing. I mean, and, and, you know, you have to look at where, well, you know, where is the, you know, the the young people, where's the vitality? Where are they, the millennial who were still in church and their kids are in church? Well, actually, that's them. Um but they're not outweighing everything else. So it's not that that didn't work. It's that that was almost could never have been a big enough phenomenon to outweigh the kind of the, you know, the slow train coming down the tracks. Right. Um, yeah. yeah but we have we a tsunami coming that, and we exactly. can... You get a few people on the boat to get out of the way, but you're not stopping the tsunami. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, literally, if you talk to, if you go and meet twenty somethings, thirty somethings who are still at mass on a Sunday, um, and and again, depending on where you are in the country, that's going to be a very different kind of dynamic. You know, it's going to be very different in, you know, rural Louisiana to you know, Portland, Oregon. You know, just to name two places where I did field work, right? Um, but generally speaking, you know, those. And it's even more the case in Britain. So it really is the case. If you're in your late teens, 20s, 30s in Britain, and you're still going to not just a Catholic church, but any kind of church, you've really had to swim against that tide. And you've had to argue not only like with your friends and probably family members, but, you know, with a, with a, a good part of yourself as to why you were there, why you are still there. You know, what does it mean to you? Does it make sense? After all the scandals, you know, Why? Which means that the ones who are there have to own it and have to be there. And if you talk to, you know, whenever I meet, and it, you know, maybe the ones I meet are the. Actually, I don't think I don't think that's true because you know, the, the, certainly the ones who you ever meet in a church context have to be the the kind of the survivors, if you like. And if you talk to those, then you know, it's going to be this JP two, but not the only reasons, right? But that's going to be a big dose of um, who's there and why. And there's going to be converts and there's going to be like evangelical, ex-evangelical converts, because that's a big that's a big part of the American scene, which is something to talk about. You know, people people like, I mean, Brendan Vogt or Scott Hahn or that whole kind of world of, um, you know, lay Catholic influences before there were influences. Right. You know, right. leaders, um, they've come out of, uh, you know, that kind of very deeply Christocentric, bibliocentric world. And, and that's part of how they've managed to kind of um, keep the faith, but then have, feel this need to give it to others, which again, yeah. in the Catholic church and the mainline churches, particularly that evangelical zeal, um, you know, really waned. So in a sense, it's, it's not, you know, the JP2 Catholics, especially in the 1990s, early 2000s, where you see a lot of people coming to church, you see Catholics, uh, cradle Catholics who are energized for the faith. It's not that those efforts didn't work. It's just that they're just, they're statistically, they get overwhelmed, so to speak. Um, and if they had, if that hadn't happened, then it'd even be worse today. Is yeah, that well, kind of what you're saying? And then who would be there? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, people. and it's not it wouldn't it's not that there wouldn't be anyone right right that there'd still be immigrants second first second generation immigrants which has always been the case with catholic parishes in britain and america you know since for centuries um and there's all you know there's always a you know it's 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 a big country there's millions of people there's a big church there's always going to be some um but that age profile would be even more skewed to the older generations had it not been for that 
kind of trend, you know, and, and, and there's different strands to that trend. There's a kind of a very uh, liturgically traditional strand. There's this, but there's also a more kind of charismatic um, worship music kind of evangelical strand. And actually those kind of folks kind of get on very well and, and you know, quite happy with either, um, in either world often. Yeah, um, right. But there's, there's different, there's different, it's not just one thing is what I'm saying. There's different streams that are playing into that. Yeah. And I've experienced that in my own life. I, I when I became Catholic, it was through the influence of charismatic Catholics. Yeah. And I had a lot of influ- uh, interaction with them through Franciscan University of Steubenville. And stuff like that. But then over the past 10 years, so I've been much more in the traditional Catholic camp. But I always feel like, you know, we're allies and uneasy at times. Yeah. But but like when you compare us to everybody else, it's like, well, we're the ones that are trying to keep the faith and pass on to our kids. I mean, that's that's kind of what, yeah. what combines. Now, one thing I've really come to believe is a major influence in the collapse of religion over the past 20, 30 years. It, and I was very happy to see that I might actually be right on this because you mentioned in your book, which is the rise of the internet that yep. we see in the 19 mid 1990s. We all, you know, the explosion of the internet in, in as a thing, I, you know, people who know, know the internet existed since the sixties, but as a thing that the average person got onto could interact with other people that I've, I'm convinced that that has caused a major shift and a major uh, has, has helped accelerate, I should say, the decline of religion. Can you speak to that about how, because you talk about it in the book, Nonverts, how, how has the internet impacted, the rise of the internet impacted the decline of religion, at least in America? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's most obvious in, because so the book, Nonverts, it, it's trying to tell kind of a, a big picture national story with kind of individual narratives, but it's also trying to tell this kind of middle MISO level uh, in the jargon story about different how how this plays out in different denominational subworlds. Okay, and this is most evident, and and so the the kind of the classic examples of this are ex Mormons and ex Evangelicals, but especially ex Mormons. So if you've been raised small town Utah, small town Idaho, rural Southern Idaho, where kind of everyone you know is some kind of Mormon, um, and everything you you know it's a very i mean it's a been his a, you know while everyone else was like losing the young people you know there's whole books written about kind of mormon envy of you know evangelicals i remember that there's a lot of stuff that we we, we wouldn't want to copy right but hey they do great with young adults they do great with kind of, kind of commitment you know there's there's all sorts of you know they do great with big families who were at church okay um so if you're raised in that world and, you know, you have doubts or, you know, there's just kind of, you have all sorts of questions or whatever, um, or, you know, there's all sorts of reasons that people, you know, might might lose their faith or, or go through traumatic things. And before the internet comes along, um, you, you don't really have avenues for exploring that or knowing other people who just aren't Mormon, right? You know, if you, you know, if you're raised in rural Utah and you kind of leave the church, you leave rural Utah, you know, so there might be like someone's cousin who you don't hear from anymore. Right. But you're not in kind of contact. Now, once the Internet comes along, well, first of all, you're exposed to a much broader range of people. Right. And you can form friendships with, you know, you form friendships around, you know, you could be in a group of something around like the music of Bob Dylan or something. And then, you know, but, you know, it's a different, it's a much more mixed world and you get friendships and, you know, um, you're exposed to a much bigger world and worldviews. But also there's this opportunity to kind of find ex-Mormons or for that cousin to s- tell you the real reason why they left. And to say, hey, I came across this. uh, They never taught us this in Sunday school kind of stuff. Okay, so particularly for those kind of Mormons, ex-Mormons, these nonverts, the Internet was just this huge thing. And and, and the evangelicals, too, to an extent, it just gave them access to a different world. Now, for some people, including actually, I was too early for this to have any major role in my conversion. because I'm a convert, too. But now it's obviously it's possible to find, you know, if you're raised as an atheist or an anything to for all sorts of weird, you know, 
workings of providence to then find yourself falling into a catholic sub world online and becoming a catholic right you see this on twitter all the time okay i've got a an ex-colleague who um uh he was a kind of an evangelical anglican um and used to he's a philosopher he used to have william lane craig videos like just playing in the background on youtube while he was working in his office and and the the algorithm started serving up bishop Barron videos <laughs> and and he, you know over time he started seeking these out and that then he became catholic like that so like all those sorts of ways in which the internet allows you to be exposed to other things that you might not otherwise have been exposed to or it allows you to go really double down into something you know right. if you find your kind of tribe online um and you know i've done this in different kind of you know as mentioned Bob Dylan, you know, different fandoms, you know, you can get really into things. And again, you know, if you, if you're a kind of, you know, if you're having doubts about something or you get in with a crowd of whatever's, then you can kind of go really deep into that. So there's this kind of relativizing effect that the internet has, but it also allows people to kind of find a tribe that isn't the tribe they grew up with. Right. So the internet coming in when you've already got this kind of, uh, religiously waned generation um absolutely is gonna as you say i think accelerate some of those trends as a catalyst yeah so uh, a, a catholic 150 years ago or whatever who's living in their ghetto you know the, it's yeah. uh, italian catholics everybody they know is catholic so more than likely they're not even uh exposed to any doubts or anything against catholicism but even if they have some, let's say they go through a period of doubts themselves. Well, who are they going to talk to? Probably their parish priest about it or yeah, their parents yeah. and, or, or their yeah. friends who are all Catholic. And so they're eventually they'll be like, OK, yeah, I, I'm just going to stay Catholic. But now they have these doubts and they get on a form, like you said, for Bob Dylan music, whatever. And somebody says something kind of anti-Catholic that leads them down a rabbit hole. And then all of a sudden now they can they can explore. But like you said, it is true that you can work the other way. In fact, there's a. a uh, a postulant nun I met recently. She's very young and I found she was a convert and she, I said, well, what's your story? And she, um, cause she's only, I think she's only like 20 or something like that right now. And she said during COVID during the lockdowns, she was like, I'm just going to look up the different Christian religions and stuff and just kind of see denominations. I, I can't remember what she was, uh, non-denominational. She's like, I just want to see what they all say. And just by literally as I think she was 17 or 16 or something like that, when she's doing it on the internet, she just eventually decides, okay, Catholicism, that's the yeah. one. And, and it was like, and praise God. I mean, it's like the algorithm usually works against us, but sometimes. Well, it, it, it is that. It's the, the net effect is probably, is, is almost certainly a negative one, which isn't to say that the it, it's, you know, within that average, there's obviously uh all sorts of ways in which people become Catholic or, or deepen them. You know, I often think that, you know, a lot of my kind of Catholic support structure, kind of my like, you know, um, plausibility structure, kind of like-minded peer groups network is, is friends of mine who are also Catholic on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, who I may have met in person, but not necessarily, but certainly, you know, wouldn't see them live, uh, you know, from, year to year and yet constantly we're constantly in touch and it's that kind of normalizes what is actually quite a weird thing to be in this society which is a practicing religious anything right right and i think that's important because i know for like my generation i struggle with this whole like the relationships you build online because i remember when my kids i have uh kids who are in their 20s now and and, and down and i remember when they first they were in a homeschool group that was online they interact with people online people like in England yep. and all over. And every, they would meet once a year at the March for Life here in, in uh, you know, Washington, D.C. And I remember when they, they so to me, they were meeting these people for the first time because they had never actually been in person with them. But so I was like, is it was it awkward? And you first met and is it going to be awkward? They're like, what are you talking about that? And sure enough, when they see them, they immediately start hugging each other. They're like talking, you know, just like so excited to see yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah. But it's like they've been friends forever because they have. Yeah. Even yeah. though for me, I struggle with that idea that they have been friends. But my point of this is the deep 
relationships you can build online and that can go either way. So you start building deep relationships with atheists, you start building deep relationships with ex-Mormons, if you're Mormon, you know, whatever the case may be, those are real. Uh, as much yeah. as I don't really, I struggle to admit that they are real relationships and they have a profound impact on people. Um, and so I think, like you said, because of the weakening already, the net impact has been negative for religion, but there have been fortunately, uh, ways it's been encouraged as well. Catholicism and religion have been encouraged. Um, I want to, I want to now focus on Catholicism specifically. Yeah. So we've talked about in general, they're weakening after the 60s, then the collapse in the 2000s. It's very common in the Catholic world to pin to, to put, pin a lot of blame on Vatican II. Now, I would when I say Vatican II, by the way, I mean the Vatican II event, meaning not just the documents, not just the council, but the council plus kind of everything that happened afterwards in the name of Vatican II yeah, and yeah. In the spirit of Vatican II, whatever you want to call it. And the unintended consequences and everything right. that kind of flows here. Yeah, all that. I mean, so uh, what would you say is the, how does Vatican II, the uh, Vatican II event, we'll say, how does that fit into this picture? Did it, you know, help? Did it hurt? Did it have no impact? I mean, how, how does it fit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as you, you know, you've read Mass Exodus, so, you know, it's, yeah. I think it's a complicated picture. Yes. Um, and, and and partly that that book was motivated by there's kind of three three traditions of of accounting for kind of Catholic decline, right? One is that it's all the council's fault. One is that every, again, broad brush strokes, but the council was great, and it was the the stifling or the suppression of the council that's the fault of it. Okay, that that. Everything was going great, and then we had these uh, conservative crackdown popes, with beginning with Humana Vitae, obviously, and then everything afterwards. And if we had just let the spirit flow, then we wouldn't have these problems. Okay. Um, and and then the third one, and that's just kind of like you know normal sociologists and social historians of kind of secularization. Uh, they might talk about the Catholic story for a bit of color, right? But but they see it very much as just a, a variation on the same themes. There's no particular Catholic story to tell. Um, now, I was adamant that it's absolutely, partly that, that there's a sense in which all of these are right. I mean, it's a, it's a big enough pie um, that there's there's plenty of room in it for all these different types of explanations to have kind of some some contribution to the whole um i think that there's absolutely a catholic story to tell so there's obviously bigger national level and again this is where it gets nebulous but kind of secularizing forces that play out on all the other churches as well at different times at different speeds with different severities um, but this isn't just a kind of Catholic thing. Equally, you know, it's true that the Catholic kind of rate, on the one hand, probably looks a bit better than certainly the mainline churches. Um, but actually, if you look at where Catholic mass going was before the council, um, you know, if you if you look at kind of Catholic religiosity can kind of compared to everyone else before the council, we've fallen a lot further to kind of now be where everyone else is. So, I mean, that's an important thing to say too, I think. Right. Um, there's also, um, it's, it's absolutely also the case that there was there was problems before the council. And I think one of my arguments is that A, this is very much the case in continental Europe. One of the reasons for the council was because there was this kind of pastoral crisis brewing. Now, what counted as a pastoral crisis in 1940s France, you know, looks like dream time <laughs> you know yeah. compared to where we are now not least in france but you know if you read kind of rana ratzinger de lubac congar danielu um in the 30s 40s 50s they're all concerned that we're losing the working classes we're losing the youth rana talks about you know the christian this is 1950s germany you know or austria you know, like the Christian now lives in a diaspora situation in his own family. You know, um, Ratzinger talks about the, um, you know, the, the the new paganism in the heart of the church that's kind of coming up. And this is the mid 50s. 
in Bavaria, right? So there's this sense of there's this pastoral crisis that we need we need to do something we need to do something about it now, right? And obviously, when the baby boomers are coming of age in Britain and, and America, you get this same kind of thing that we're losing the young people. We need to do something. We need to be radical. We need to do something bold, or we're going to lose them. And, and so, in a sense, one of the things I argue in Mass Exodus is that the council. Um, the council's liturgy document, Sacrosanctum Concilium, is, is really, um, it liberalizes, it, it opens up possibilities, right? And, and if you read the document, it's clear that it expects that the main line of post-conciliar liturgy will look really, certainly by, in today's eyes, very traditional, right? There's this expectation that it's going to be Latin, it's going to be plain chant, it's going to be, you know, there may be some vernacular you know, at, at certain times, right? But it opens up possibilities. It says, well, especially in mission territories, you know, it's possible to adapt things more radically if it's pastorally, you know, helpful, you know, if if it works, right? right. And I do think that part of the, the the chaos of the implementation of the council, particularly in kind of Western Europe and America after the council, was this kind of desperation is that nothing's really working young people like folk music let's have some of that and of course it was, it was almost done badly yeah <laughs> yeah you know like you know it wasn't like bob dylan and rambling jack elliott it was like peter paul and mary and it was it was badly done because of course it was badly done it was like who, who's got a guitar who, who can come up and do this right uh, and it changed week on week on week on week. And, and the baby boomers were the least likely people to be in any one parish for that acclimatization period because they were going off to college. They were here, there and everywhere. You know, it's a period when they're they're not likely to be in kind of one place at one time. So all the pastoral craziness, by the time it settles down, um, you know, isn't the, isn't the, the, red, the, the mass they were brought up with. Um, and they've not been there when they kind of got used to the new normal. So it doesn't, it's not surprising that they don't go, um, you know, when in the 70s, 80s. So there is this Catholic and, and you know, remember that, you know, um, vast numbers of priests and religious left their, their vocations in this period, you know, often together, often kind of two by two. And, and you talk to people and they say that this was, this was like just a really serious kind of blow to their own Catholicism when, you know, the priests and the nuns who they kind of looked to as, you know, even if they had doubts sometimes, you know, you knew that Sister Mary Athanasius didn't. And, you know, you could kind of vicariously, you know, she seemed to know the answers. She knew she was solid. And then, you know, you see her in jeans and then the next week after that, she's gone. That, I think, had this sense of, um, disorientation, I think, is probably the word. Yeah, I think, um, and I think the disorientation in every way because just show, I know, like for example, um, my father-in-law, he he would talk about how you know he liked the old mass, and he was in his thirties when things started to change, and he would just show up, and it would be different. Yeah, and like, yeah, and yeah. it's like, he just didn't, it wasn't even, he wasn't a theological person. He wasn't like, he was just, he was a good guy, good Catholic, believed. And then it's like, it was very disorienting. Yeah, yeah. And he would always try to remain at the most quote unquote conservative parish in town until finally there was no quote unquote conservative parish in town. They were all doing this stuff. And it was just very disorienting for him. And now, God bless him, he remained faithful and stayed Catholic till his death. But so many of his contemporaries didn't. And so it, I've kind of said this, and I want you to tell me if I'm completely wrong. And, and so I'll stop saying it. Um, <laughs> but I feel like Vatican II, the event, the intention behind it was uh, sincere and solid in the sense that we are seeing some weakening. We need to do something about it. Yeah, yeah. But what they actually did 
not only in general didn't help, but it actually hurt. It, it made it worse than if they had done nothing. Now, I'm not saying in specific, there aren't specific people who weren't helped, but I mean, on an aggregate, I feel like the Vatican II event made things worse than if they had done nothing. I think if they'd done nothing, things would have gone downhill a lot, but I feel like things wouldn't have gone as downhill as they did if we just, if they had just done nothing. Do you think that's completely out of line? Is it a possibility? No, I mean, or... I, I think, I mean, I think that's actually fair. I, I, I think I make a point in the mass exodus that had there not been a council, I'd probably be writing a book about how they should have, you know, there, there should have been a council, right? <laughs> right? We needed a council to address these things, but I expect that the, you know, what I would be counting as, you know, the terrible uh, missed opportunities, you know, would, would not look as bad as, as as what it does in terms of numbers right now. Um, I think it. The, I think one of the, the the tragedies of the council, if you like, was if you had to pick. Well, first of all, that there was a, and I'm thinking particularly about liturgical reform, right, and and, and how it played out. There was an what you might call a an anthropological naivete around how it works because there was this idea that well we need to get rid of all the um all the extras all the accretions all the the superstitious add-ons so we can focus on the mass and if we you know we don't want people saying the rosary in church we don't want the tabernacle in the middle we want to have that off at the side because it's all about the mass but actually you know, this idea that somehow you know someone who was kind of you know, at the parish every evening, you know, like sewing sequins on the, the, the dress of the infant of Prague or, or anything that was going on, novenas, you know, 40 hours devotions, that the people who were doing this were somehow uh, less focused on Sunday. So if we get rid of all that, then Sunday will kind of rise even greater. And actually it was, it's the opposite. You know, what all that is, is the scaffolding that holds Sunday up. And if you get rid of everything, then it's just Sunday to Sunday. Now, there's all sorts of reasons why that kind of rich kind of paraliturgical life was on the way in any way, because there was a lot more to do on, you know, mid midweek evenings and, the, you know, and the baby boomer, you know, girls were not probably going to follow their mothers in, you know, whatever sodality of whatever it had been. Right. Right. So there's all those sorts of changes happening anyway. But the the kind of the sweeping away of the saints of, of, of kind of normal devotions of, you know, statues with candles in front of them in churches um, of, of Friday abstinence is, is the classic case here. Yeah. You know, even people, even kind of people who are seen as kind of liberal comment, Andrew Greeley is not regarded as one of the, you know, <laughs> the kind of the trad sociologists because, you know, commentators on, on American Catholicism. He thinks like, Friday abstinence, getting rid of that was just the greatest kind of own goal, you know, yeah. shooting yourself in the face, let alone the foot. I have met people. I've met, I, I remember talking to a man who literally left the church over that. Now, he fortunately yeah. came back for his death. But, I mean, he said, because in his mind was, the church said it's a mortal sin to eat meat on Friday. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, the next day, they say it's not a mortal sin to eat meat on Friday. Go ahead and do it if you want to. And to him, it's like, why should I believe them about anything then? If they're if they're able to say something's immortal now, I I mean, yes, theologically we can explain all that. Yeah. But I'm talking about just the average person yeah. does not have that training. They just say, Well, if you're gonna say it, and so when they also say at the same time that the Pope says that it's a moral sin to use our official contraception, but my bishop didn't say that. He kind of my priest kind of suggested yeah, it's yeah, not. Yeah. Well, why should I even listen to the Pope? Because today he might say that, but they drop Friday abstinence, they're probably gonna drop their artificial contraception ban one day too. And so why should I even listen to him? I was literally about to make that link because it's the, the reason why human IV type becomes a thing. We talk about in the wake of, you know, the aftermath of human IV type. It's because it's the one thing that didn't change. Right. And, you know, there's no aftermath of Casti Canubi or whatever. Right. No one expected, you know, of course, the church, Catholic, Catholic church doesn't change. Right. So it's something right. that changed that. Um, and, and, and I think the, 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 the reason why Humanae Vitae was this massive thing was arguably it was the one thing that a significant proportion of the laity could happily have seen changed. Mm -hmm. And not only could everything else change, but also they'd, they'd had like a, a couple of years of being kind of 
informed by priests and you know bishops and if they were following the the religious press you know the word on the street was that it was going to be changed so you'd have you know you'd have marriage prep telling you that well they're going to change this in a you know they're going to change this or you know a guy i know in the vatican says you know all that kind of like priests who were staking their authority and and cred street cred if you like on it's going to change and then it didn't and it's that kind of the one immovable thing um the that becomes the, the stumbling li literally right. becomes a stumbling block um and and that was the you know if, if nothing else had changed including and you're right about things like for, you know you look back and you think well why were people equating friday abstinence with you know much more important moral matters but in fact people do because the church says church says that and that the reason is that the church has always said that and there's a better theological reason but the kind of the immediate prosaic reason is that, well, this is what we do. Well, it's an identity thing, too, because yeah. if they are ever around non-Catholics, they're identified by the fact that they're not eating meat on Friday. So when yeah. they go out to lunch with their coworkers on a Friday, everybody knows, oh, yeah, George yeah. has to he has to have fish or he has to have whatever. He can't have meat because he's a Catholic. And this and is so, I mean, my, my favorite really anecdote important. here is, is, is about the McDonald's fillet of fish sandwich, which is. Which is from my hometown, Cincinnati. That's where right. it started. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and actually, right down the street from where I grew up. <laughs> yeah, because a franchisee in a Catholic neighborhood was taking a massive hit in his takings every Friday. Right. Um, and so he creates a fillet of fish, and that just wouldn't happen afterwards. The fillet of fish isn't even isn't. I'm not a fan of the fillet of fish. Oh, right? it's awful. It's it's, it's, it's awful. It's, I don't. It's not meat. Fact, I don't think it's fish either. Exactly. But the fact that that was the sort of the great you know that neighborhood uh, yeah. like i said i grew up just very yeah, yeah. right in the next neighborhood that's very catholic area Absolutely. like you you literally the thing you asked people when you met them is what parish do you go to yeah. that was the yeah. question yeah. and that's where it started um because that was the identifying factor yeah. now so it seems like from what you're saying like i feel like the church leaders recognized there's a weakening going on and this i'm talking 1960s and there's this week in 50s, 60s, this weekend going on. But I feel like, for example, you mentioned how the boomer kid girls probably would not have been, a lot of them wouldn't have been interested in the sodalities and things like that and, and, and doing the, the, the dresses for the infant of Prague and stuff like that. But I feel like what the church's response to that was, I mean, there's two, three different responses you could have. One is you go harder into against it, like go uber Catholic. We're yep. going to go more into it. Another is you take some of it, you don't take other parts of it, and you kind of adapt it. But I feel like what they did was the third, which is we're going to lean into it. Okay, the girls aren't going to join Sodality. We're going to abolish the Sodality stuff. We're going to, the, 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 the kids don't really like mass. They're kind of confused by Latin and Latin. We're going to completely abolish Latin and mass and Latin. They like this music. We're going to completely embrace this music in the mass. And I feel like they just went completely in on it and that was not, I don't know if the first or second are the right answer, but I'm, I, I feel like we've got pretty good evidence. The third was not the right answer of just going into it. Does that make sense? No, I, th I think that's right. I, you know, I make a chess analogy, which is it's never the, you know, I don't go for a sports analogy that, you know, and, you know, this kind of queen sacrifice, you know, it's, if it works, it's like this, like glorious, you know, sacrifice that led to the, you know, the, the win, if it fails that it, it, it's catastrophic, right? And and I think that, that that there's an element of that, but also I think that there was this kind of, I mean, I think one of the things is that you know if you had to pick a moment in you know the past, I don't know however many centuries, you know if you had to pick a decade to do some pastoral experimentation, um, where you kind of wanted you know the nearest thing to kind of social laboratory conditions where you know all other things being equal, let's make some changes and see see what the effects are. The 1960s in a, anywhere, but also but in America particularly, is the the one decade that you'd avoid where everything's changing. You know, everything's gonna change. So to be, you know, messing around with key bits of Catholic practice and identity and belief at a time when everything else is changing, partly means that you can always blame anything that goes wrong on something else. Right? You can always say, oh well. It wasn't what we. It wasn't. It wasn't the liturgical changes that that that, that didn't um, 
produce the fruits we expected. It, it was the other things going on at the same time. And then you often hear this about Vatican II, is that, that you can't blame the council for the decline because A, there was problems beforehand, which is true. Um, but also there's all these other factors that are kind of affecting all those other churches that didn't have an ecumenical council in the 1960s, which is also true. But the reason why, and if you read the first paragraphs of Sacrosanctum Concilium, the council is called because they recognize there's problems and it's called to address those problems. And it lays out some pretty kind of, you know, clear kind of what you might call key performance indicators of how you how you know the reform has re has done the reforming, how you know that it, it's worked. Because it's about past pastoral efficaciousness. Right. And. If the council hasn't, I mean, what you can say is that imagine how much worse it would be had it not been for the council. And with every passing year, that's become, you know, more and more implausible because how much worse could it be? You know, 50 <laughs> years later. I mean, but it's sad that we're getting to that point when you yeah. think, well, honestly, you know, how much worse could not having had a council be at this point? Which isn't to say that. There's a third option of a, a differently timed, a differently implemented, a differently, you know, kind of done reform, which is probably the best option. Um, but but I, I, I think that's absolutely fair. Um, yeah. And I think that um, I mean, the fact is, is that if you read what the bishops at the time were saying, I, I read a book uh, uh writing between Evelyn Waugh and the Cardinal. Yes, I quote that. We quote that in the very short introduction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, there's this, there's this promise. I mean, I think that the, I can't remember what was the, uh, our, our Cardinal's name. I can't remember. I think it was in Westminster, but I can't remember what his Heenan. name was. Oh yeah. Heenan. Right. And like, he has this sincere belief. I, it seemed, it, at least that's how I interpret it, looking at his letters that if we just trust what the Vatican is saying, like the committee on the liturgy and all stuff, it will all, it will make people come back. It will bring, I think he sincerely was like, Hey, People are leaving. We need to do this to get them to come back. And Evelyn Waugh, who was right, actually was like, no, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and I think I just feel like that's there's a certain tragedy and sadness when you read that, because I think a lot of the bishops of the time, they really felt like, yes, we got to do something. And it's almost like, you know. <laughs> OK, I didn't want to get too political, but like, you know, how when you have a, a, a crisis and it's like we got to do something. And it leads to panic and you just do everything. And usually it makes it worse. And I feel like that's almost kind of what they they did back then. It was like, we have to do something. People are leaking out, young people particularly. So let's do it. Um, I, yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, well, Heenan actually agrees with war about a lot of stuff. I mean, he does. And yes. And, he, and, he, and it, but there's also you're right that there's this kind of like my hands are tied kind of thing. And, you know, right. and he he's bitching privately. Yeah bitching about you know all the chaos that's happening as well yeah i feel but like he's, he's saying he's the archbishop of westminster you know right, like we he, have to trust that what they're saying yeah, yeah, is yeah. right even though my gut tells me it's wrong yeah yeah, yeah. your gut why well, it tells you it's wrong but we just have to go along with it because that's what they're saying and, and it there will is, work there is a sense in which that i think and you one of the sources that i i loved reading for the, writing the very short introduction um, was the, the council diary of Bishop uh, Marion Forst of Dodge City, Kansas, which is just a brilliant book. Um, and it's just his kind, you know, not one of the major players, right? He's just kind of one right. of the bit part people commenting is, you know, is his thoughts throughout the council. But he talks about how, like, you know, he'll spend all this time at the council and then he'll go back to his diocese in the off season and then, like, have his bit priests tell him what's happening at the council. And he's like, like, dudes that's that's literally not what the council is saying or what's happening or what's being talked about but there's this kind of um runaway effect of this kind of uh what the council is 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 intending meaning um that only grows after the council and then obviously i mean we've not even talked about doctrine and catechesis but you know we, you don't get a catechism and you know until the 90s so there's this period where you've got competing accounts of what the council has taught on various issues. 
Right. Like you have things um, like the Dutch catechism. Yeah, exactly. So Which there's all right. this kind of, and, and, and then there's this whole new catechetical style. So, you know, people argue that we've got this kind of like lost generation who were never properly catechized, which again is probably true. Yeah. Um, but again, there was this sense in which you couldn't use the old catechisms because they were now out of date, but we didn't have anything new that was actually solid, you know, until the best part of 30 years later. Right. Now, I, I knew this was going to happen, that we're going to go longer than normal. I hope you can stay because I, I, I want I, I, I want to address today. Like, what yeah. do we do today? What is working now? One of the things I, I, I have mentioned numerous times, I've, I've, I actually did a survey um, uh, of this for crisis, and that is the uh, rise of the, the Latin mass communities, that if you look at the numbers, just objectively, most places in, in the West, I'm talking about America, you know, Western Europe, Canada, things like that, you see a huge decrease in numbers in Catholic parishes. But we're also seeing an increase, a pretty dramatic increase, especially in the past couple of years with the Latin mass communities. And I'm, we could go into, but I'm not, we're not going to like Pope Francis response and all that stuff. But the point, I, I, my question is, do you think that is something that can be a, would be the answer or a answer that would, that could be widespread? Or do you think it's more a matter of simply the few Catholics that are left, they are more likely to embrace such a thing. And so a lot of them are leaving their Novus Ordo kind of wishy-washy parish for the Latin mass. And that's really, it's really more that than anything else. Like where, where would you say that it, it ranks and all that? Yeah. I mean, for, first of all, I'm, we used to go to the Latin Mass uh, when there was one. So we live in a town that's got a big parish church, and, and there just happened to be a tiny church that was built in the early 19th century. And this tiny little village that was like it was a Catholic landowner, and it was before kind of Catholicism was kind of legally emancipated or whatever. Right? Um, which is a whole other story. Um, and the parish priest, uh, you know, he, he did the liturgy well whenever he did the liturgy, but, you know, he did a traditional Latin mass at noon on a Sunday, and it's it's about 20 minutes drive. So we used to go there, and there was reasons why we went there. I mean, I like the liturgy. The demographics of the Latin mass community is there's lots of kids. So the kids like the kids. <laughs> uh, and also noon was a good time. So this was perfect. So we used to go there. We're still members of our own parish. Kids went to the parish school, um, still do. But, you know, we'd go there. And then that parish kind of gets, the, the parish priest get not because of this, he just moves. That parish gets served from our parish. The Latin mass is no longer done. You know, Latin mass is now, you know, a further drive away in the evening, which just isn't, just doesn't work with small children and, and that kind of stuff. So we've stopped going. Um, now, we have friends who, you know, will drive an hour and a half, two hours at whatever time with a van full of kids, you know, and, and you know, God love them. You know, that's yeah. the kind of commitment and that's the kind of parish community you want. So, um, but that's not us, right? That's not us. Um, so I think one of the, the great things about the Latin mass folk and I consider myself one, um, is that given, and we talked about this before, you know, given everything else that's going on, you know, all the kind of waned thing, the, you know, the shaky parish, you know, all sorts of stuff. Looking to the future, you know, we know that, you know, um, the importance of kind of social networks for religious commitment so if you hang out with other equally religious people you're likely to stay more religious yourself right it's because we're, we're social animals right benedict talks about this in uh caritas and veritate i think um no in um uh whatever that the whatever the first encyclical of benedict of uh, francis was that benedict oh, right I remember that one. I liked that it. One. And I was yeah, like, yeah, oh, wow. Great, yeah, yeah. But then I realized Benedict's people would actually yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> so it's that one. Um, so anyway, so what you want is that given that, you know, to be a young, committed Catholic is pretty rare. Actually, what we want is to get all those ones together. 
because what you don't want is to thin them out over the parishes so they're the only ones so they just get assimilated into the normal thing you actually strategically you want the committed ones to at least some of the time gather together with the other committed ones so that becomes the kind of the normal peer and for the kids you want them to hang out with other kids for whom you know mass and you know prayer at bedtime is a, a normal it might be boring but it's a thing that other kids like you also have to do it's a normal thing right, right? now the traditional latin mass community is a good example of this uh you know syro malabar eastern catholics are another good example of this uh you know there'll be all sorts of polish language i'm just talking about our context here in britain you know there's certain kind of niche liturgical communities where you're going to see similar dynamics in play and it could be charismatics going to a gathering at a particular church for particular reasons but the kinds of people who are going to travel to a, for a particular liturgical offering are going to be pretty hardcore and they're going to be in a room full of people who are pretty hardcore and that's what you want right now i think in this country at least and you know whatever things might be like in individual dioceses or country i don't know i mean i never saw i mean i'm not saying that there aren't problem trad communities right who are basically schismatics and aren't doing whatever and obviously you see a lot more of this online than you do actually if you go to the latin mass right, right. it's not that there aren't like there's not a spec there's a spectrum of theological and political views in any congregation right and you know The Latin mass communities that I've been to in Britain or America seem like exactly the sorts of thing that any bishop and any Vatican would be wanting to foster as part of the ecosystem. It's not for everyone, right? I, I'm, I'm really not one of these people who think that, so if, you know, if we came back to the Latin mass, you know, all the problems would be solved. I, I think, in a sense, the loss of all that um, 50 years ago means that unless it grows organically over a long period of time by you know gathered communities for whom this is normal who then get the opportunity to have that as their ongoing formation when they have their kids and that kind of stuff um, like the eastern catholic churches do ideally um you know i don't think that you know if, if we all suddenly went i think we'd have this kind of massive crisis again because that's not people's mass and people don't like change right and now the people who are there are used to something suddenly changing it in any big way uh, it, it just isn't going to work and now that's not to say that there isn't and, and this is the great thing that benedict had benedict had this idea was like well there's certain people who want this and are spiritually nourished by it, which i think is actually a very kind of vatican II view is that there's certain liturgical configurations that are more or less pastoral pastorally efficacious with certain groups and you know the the latin rite is big enough to accommodate these differences and that seemed to me to be a very healthy view and it also allowed this idea of you know the the cross fertilization of you know so you get a lot of novus ordo priests who celebrate ad orientum for example you know which is a kind of a you know a retro move or you know they'll have a bit of latin in there or they'll do certain things that and, and that seemed to be quite a healthy bringing together the two worlds for a time i think the crackdown on it is is whatever the problem was or is in certain places the solution is is, is a pastoral disaster and and just cruel actually yeah, that's a good and, and, and it. It, it, it's a at a time when you know almost any group of committed Catholics ought to be cherished and nurtured, let alone ones that are having lots of kids who all love the you know who people who love the Catholic faith and 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 you know it it seems a crazy purely on a pastoral you know forget about theology forget about you know liturgical history or whatever 
purely looked at kind of strategically pastorally it's crazy yeah it is um it kind of brings me to one thing i want to bring up which is kind of the response like how should catholics today respond to this uh and not just Catholics, Catholics, but all Christians, religious, uh, to the decline. It, and you bring it up in your in nonverts near the end, as you all you present almost two different categories of response from practicing Christians of what to do. One is the you know the the I think you call it exile in place quietism, kind of the Benedict option. The okay, let's hunker down and keep the faith in our community, keep the faith, pass it on to our kids. And wait for a better day, so to speak. Almost, you know, like St. Benedict, as Roger uh, suggested, did through the Dark Ages. And then the other, which I know you had a difficult time, I think, finding a name for it. I think at one point you call it like uh, MAGA Christianity, yeah, just yeah, the yeah. idea that you that we we go out there and that that like the first options for wimps and for defeatists and whatnot. And I see this online all the time where you, you see two people who are both devoted, practicing catholics who love the lord and, and want the church to succeed one will be of the more benedict option will be the more of the maga christianity and boy they really can go at it i mean and and, and so the idea of the maga christianity is more the we got to fight and we got to retake the culture type of thing do you have do you think one has more possibility for success are they both kind of doomed for failure i know i have a preference but i will not reveal it at this point but you know but what would you say you know i mean i think ben benedict option properly understood and actually if you read the book i mean you, you see this kind of stereotyped as you know catholic amish or like jonestown kind of uh bunker communities which it, you know if you read the book he's like saying hey there's this suburb outside washington dc where all the catholic families in a you know in 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 a few blocks meet for barbecues you know every sunday it's that kind of leaning into things that we know work and one of the things that we know works is hanging out with other commit like-minded others right so if i hang out with other massive bob dylan fans right i'm gonna get like I'm going to go deeper and deeper into that rabbit hole. And when I used to spend my time online hanging out with serious Bob Dylan fans, you know, I was collecting, you know, the the, the bootleg recordings of every show. You know, you it was a normal thing to like not just go to a show on a tour, but to try and go to all the shows on the tour and, and that kind of thing. If you're not hanging out with that kind of group of extremists, then, you know, you just kind of have a much more kind of normal way of doing it. And it's a bit like that with you know church if you hang out with people for whom you know the faith is a serious part of their lives and it's then that helps you be someone for whom the faith is a serious part of your life and you in turn a part of their you know kind of mutually supporting plausibility structure networks right they're kind of tribe they're kind of crowd um and so i think i mean there's a sense in which the benedict option you know it, isn't simply let's hunker down and wait for things to change. It's actually the best thing we can do to help things change, given the situation we're in isn't going to suddenly be turned around, you know, barring some miraculous intervention anytime soon. So the critical thing is to keep the faith to the next generation, to have this kind of seriously um intellectually formed catholic subculture where yes we're attracting a few of the you know the other weirdos in the wider culture you know who who, who want to join us and you know i'm i'm one of those um but also and again it's going to be very difficult you know the the white you know it's going to it's an uphill battle but you know if you have enough kids and, you know, you do your best to raise them in the faith, then, you know, you're going to gain the odds in raising at least some of them to then be the next generation of committed Catholics who will, you know, raise their kids and that kind of thing. Um, so it's that kind of, it's almost a kind of a classic minority religion strategy and inverted you know this is kind of like you know what jews did in the diaspora for mm -hmm. 
you know, centuries, millennia. I mean, a again, but 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 by no means, you know, that that makes it sound like we're, you know, some. I'm, you know, I'm certainly not making analogies to, you know, a persecuted, right? You know, so but but for any kind of community that, you know, in a sense, the 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 hand we're dealt is to do what we can now that puts us in a stronger position in the next generation than it would be if we didn't do these things essentially yeah and i i actually agree with everything you just said because i i kind of lean i think the benedict option is often misunderstood what Dreher was trying to say and i think that um i, I think for example we go to a latin mass community uh, parish uh, we homeschool our kids. Actually, our, our parish also celebrates in Novus Ordo, but we go to the Latin Mass there. Uh, we we homeschool our kids, um, and so that alone, you know, we our kids watch Veggie Tales. So therefore, yeah. that alone makes it that we're part of we're we're living out kind of what he was saying with the Benedict Option because we're right. living a, a counterculture. And well, we still go to baseball games. We still go. You know, we st it's not like we're we're not Amish. I mean, I I got nothing at the Amish, by the way. You know, God bless them. But at the same time, we're not doing that either. We're, we're still in the world on some level, but we are more out of the world, I would say, than, for example, my wife's parents were in the when they, she was, they were raising their kids in the 60s and 70s uh, by the very fact that that's just the way it is, that, that, that the surrounding culture is so much less Christian, anti-Christian, even anti-Catholic, yeah. that it just this is the way it has to be. So my last question I want to ask you was, You've interviewed a lot of people who have left the, the faith, and there's a lot of parents who are Catholic parents who are listening to this, watching us, and they might want kind of like, what advice from seeing how a lot of kids left, these kids have left, what would you say to parents who want their kids not to leave? I mean, would it be that be in a community like you just said, or was there is there some advice you would give that, you know, that what what you mean, you've seen what doesn't work? that could work that, that parents could do? Yeah, I think, first of all, um, you can do everything right and still end up with kids who leave, right? Like, and there's, there's you talk, I mean, I, you, I talk to a lot of parents who say literally we, de we did everything right. You know, what's, what's going on? You know, we love our kids. Our kids are great. We love their partners. But the great sadness is that the kids don't aren't baptized and, you know, aren't taken to mass and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and you can do everything right and, and that still happens and and you know that's just the that the hand we're dealt okay mm -hmm. now the things that we do know like help game the odds and it, you know we really are talking about on you know on the average is the, th the sorts of things that uh increase the likelihood of any one person growing up to be a religiously committed adult is Religious practice in the home growing up, um, you know, and that's not just going to church on a Sunday. It's things like, you know, praying before meals. It's things like, you know, uh, hanging out with other Catholic, whatever the well, Catholic in this instance family is. It's this kind of intentional religiosity. Now, you can read a lot of there's plenty of people who were raised like that who have left. Right. But on the which is that's that's true. But on the average, that helps, right? You know, you sometimes say it's like, well, you don't want to raise them too religious because then then they always rebel. And it's like, well, actually, some do. Um, but the average is that you know it, it's much better odds than 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 not doing that. Um, I mean, the other thing, I mean, there's this kind of balance between being and you know different families and especially depending on where you were you know, are going to draw the the kind of the the cultural distinctiveness differently. You know, do you send them to the the the, uh, the public school or the Catholic school? Do you homeschool? Do you, you know, only watch EWTN? You know, do you only watch whatever? Do you actually think that, the, that what the church needs is culturally, you know, a conversant, normal people? who were also very deeply rooted in the faith, which actually I think the church does need. Um, it's that kind of balance. And there's really, there's, you know, there's no kind of set path to, you know, there's, 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 there's no silver bullet. There's no kind of, you know, here's this one weird trick 
that 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 kind of solves the problem. But I mean, the basics really, and and maybe the basics are what we lost after the council. You know, praying novenas, saints, um, all those sorts of things. A social life, you know, it doesn't have to be about churchy stuff. But if you're hanging out, if you're playing football with other churchy people, if you kind of just do normal things, but that's your social group that helps. And actually, you know, mega church is again not a silver bullet, but evangelicalism compared to our numbers, you know, are doing better because they kind of gamed that system in a certain sense. Yeah, I, I think that's that, that, that's great advice. I, I really do think that is because it's like a lot of times trads are attacked because they, you know, you just won't go back to the 1950s. And really, it's more a matter of I just think that things like Eucharistic processions, you know, doing novenas at church, praying the rosary as a family, you know, having uh, uh, meatless Fridays, all these things are little points of contact with yeah. the faith that do help pass it on. Not 100 percent, but better than if you don't do them. And so yeah, it's like, absolutely. you know, so we want to do those, but they're good in themselves. Obviously, something like the procession stuff is good in itself. But from a parish perspective, I also know that they do help deepen that connection. I remember Cardinal Dolan wrote about this years ago about the Catholic identity markers like Meatless Fridays and ashes on your forehead on, on ash. Yeah. Stuff like that. They really do help pass on the faith. Um, and so I think that, that that's you know, so we should make sure with our kids, we do those things. So it doesn't guarantee it, like you said, but it does like game the odds a little bit in our favor. Yeah, there is a spectrum. You talked about the Amish. I mean, like the, Ar the Amish do a great job at keeping people. The Amish are like, I talk about this in the book, like, you know, high birth rate and keeping most of them Amish, you know, generation on, you know, the Amish keep doubling about every 20 years. I mean, like there, there comes a point when we'll all be Amish. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> trends continue. But that's obviously a particular choice that that isn't that certainly isn't kind of you know the we're called to be in the world but not of the world kind of thing. Right. Um, there's obviously a spectrum from that to kind of full cultural uh, and then actually becoming you know one of the things that I think is critical in all of this is you know like even what the day before yesterday were just kind of like normal uh, mainstream positions are becoming more and more deeply countercultural, especially on life issues. Right. Um, and actually any kind of uh, holding to these is going to be marking you off from, you know, the wider culture. Right. Um, you just have to deal with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to let you go here because I've taken your, a lot of your time. I really appreciate it. I could, I could go on forever, but I want to encourage people um, to get your books, the uh, non-verts, the making of ex-Christian America. That that's your latest, and it's it, excellent. I just, in fact, I won't say who it is, but I recently talking to a very influential Catholic person in this country. We'll just say that, and I, I told him you got to get this book, and he literally pulled out his phone and he bought it like right there that moment. So who that is after this, when we when we in secret. Yeah, <laughs> I will. Um, and also, but I also recommend Mass Exodus. Mass Exodus. Um, when did this come out a few a couple years ago, right? Like two or three years ago, something like that. Um, what's the 2019? So this is excellent for Catholics, especially. I, I highly recommend both of them. And then uh, why don't you tell us? I think you're working on another book on Vatican II or something. Uh, and, Vatican II, a very short introduction, is out now. So that's it is. literally due out. It's certainly come out in the UK. It'd be out in the States. You know, Amazon will tell you, but certainly within the next month or two. Okay. I'm sure it'll be great then. Um, okay, and where can people find out uh, about you? Twitter? Do you have a website? Or, or... Uh, yeah, if you Google me, you know Stephen with a PH Bullivant, uh, you'll find me. I'm on Twitter uh, SS Bullivant, but you know I'm pretty easy to find if you want to. So okay, you know, to. very good, very good. Okay, well, thank you very much again. I appreciate you coming on for this uh, great discussion. Okay, everybody, until next time. God